Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Toop, and I have the honor to serve as president of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. And I'm delighted to welcome each and every one of you here this afternoon for Congress 2017's second Big Thinking Lecture. I want to acknowledge uh, that Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee, uh, and it, of course, brought them together to share territory and to protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous peoples and nations, Europeans and all newcomers, have been invited into this treaty in a spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We at the Federation are also grateful for the hard work and preparation undertaken by our host university, Ryerson, and we want to thank them for their great hospitality. J'aimerais signaler, avant de commencer, que nous proposons un service d'interprétation simultanée au moyen de votre téléphone cellulaire. Les détails se trouvent à l'entrée de l'auditorium et sur les chablais près de la strade. Je me souhaite euh, remercier aussi le Conseil de recherche en sciences humaines, la Fondation canadienne pour l'innovation et Université Canada pour leur parrainage de la série de causeries voire grandes. It's thanks to the generosity of these sponsors that we are able to make these events open to the public for all to enjoy. I want to extend a special thanks today to the, our sponsors for the session, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. As we consider Canada's past and future promoted and prompted by the, com uh, the Congress theme, the next 150 on Indigenous lands, the Big Thinking series gives us an opportunity to explore issues that transform, I hope inspire, and certainly challenge us. Today is no exception. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Wade Davis, Professor and BC Leadership Chair in Cultures and Ecosystems at Risk at the University of British Columbia. I'd now like to invite Christopher Walters, Director of Communications at the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council to introduce our speaker, Christopher. Thank you and good afternoon everyone. Welcome to this Big Thinking Lecture. The Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council is proud to be a sponsor of Congress and with the Federation to present thought-provoking talks like this one. Nous sommes fiers de nous associer à la Federation tout au long de l'année pour présenter aux principaux législateurs fédéraux au moyen de causerie voie grande tenue sur le colline du Parlement et d'autres activités rayonnement, les plus récents résultats de recherche en sciences humaines. Nous sommes heureux de poursuivre cet important partenariat dans tous les mois, dans les mois et les années à venir. Our mission at SHIRC is twofold. We fund social sciences and humanities research that is innovative, transformative, and helps contribute to the betterment of Canadian society. And we facilitate the communication of that knowledge so that policymakers and stakeholders can make informed, evidence based decisions that have positive impacts on society. Les causeries voie grand sont pour nous un moyen de partager ces connaissances. Elles nous permettent de présenter divers points de vue sur les sujets d'actualité. I know with the incredible lineup of discussions, presentations, and workshops at Congress that it's hard to choose which event to attend. But you've made a great decision in choosing this one. We are about to hear from the incomparable Wade Davis. Among many things, Wade Davis has passionately written about and actively advocated for the conservation of the sacred headwaters basin in northern British Columbia. This is the source of three wild salmon rivers, the Skeena, the Nass, and the Stikine. A native of British Columbia himself, Wade has lived and worked in the Stikeen as a park ranger and a guide, so his understanding of the region is both personal and profound. Dire que Wade est un homme de renaissance est un euphemisme. Il détient des diplômes en 
Anthropology et en Biologie et un diplôme de doctorat en Ethnobotany de Harvard. His day job is Professor of Anthropology and the BC Leadership Chair in Cultures and Ecosystems at Risk at the University of British Columbia. But he is also an explorer and was named one of the explorers of the millennium by the National Geographic Society. This society has described him as, and I quote, a rare combination of scientist, scholar, poet, and passionate defender of all of life's diversity. He has spent over three years in the Amazon and the Andes discovering and studying the plants of, and living among 15 different indigenous groups. Add to this already impressive list photographer, author, filmmaker, biologist, honorary vice president of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and a member of the National Geographic Society's Explorers Council. And you have an incredibly engaged, thoughtful authority on our natural world and the challenges it faces. But his accomplishments don't end there. Wade has authored 265 scientific and popular articles as well, over, as well as over 19 books, including one about the sacred headwaters of which you are about to hear. His extraordinary photographs vividly documenting indigenous cultures and nature have been exhibited around the world and featured in over 30 books and 100 magazines, including Time and National Geographic. Wade has lectured at over 200 universities and delivered the CBC Massey Lecture in 2009. He has also spoken from the main stage of the popular TED speaker series five times, and his talks have been viewed by three million people worldwide. Last year, he was named to the Order of Canada. Nous sommes très honorés qu'il s'adresse à nous aujourd'hui. We're very honored to have him speak today, so I'd like to introduce Professor Wade Davis. Well, thank, thank you very, very much, Christopher and Stephen, uh, for a wonderful introduction. Uh, you know, some of you who know my work know that I'm very much um, an activist anthropologist, very much in the tradition of Franz Boas and Ruth Benedict, who famously wrote that the entire point of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. And much of my career I spend on the road traveling to indigenous societies throughout the world, um, really trying to share with the world a fundamental lesson of anthropology, which is really simple. Every culture has something to say, each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. But this afternoon, the organizers have asked me to tell a much more personal story um, of our own backyard. So this is not a story of Tibet, or the Amazon, of life in the Arctic ice, or in the Syrian sands of the Sahara. It's a story of where I live, a place known to the Taltan peoples as the sacred headwaters, the origin of the three great salmon rivers of, of home. It's a place where in a long day, perhaps two, you can follow the tracks of grizzly and wolf and drink from the very sources uh, that give rise to the three great rivers, the Stikine, the Skeen, and the Nass, the rivers that cradled the civilization of the Pacific Northwest. But this is also very much a story of landscape and memory, and the of the fluidity of memory and our haunting capacity to forget. How many of us, for example, recall that in the lifetime of our grandfathers, the return of the salmon colored the oceans off of British Columbia, or that there was a moment when the sheer number of cod in the Atlantic caused European sailing ships to come to a halt for the sheer density of animals in the water? How, how many of us remember that in the lifetime of my great-grandfather, passenger pigeons made 40% of all birds in North America. Audubon described flocks of two and three billion birds eclipsing the sun over the city of Cincinnati and Knoxville. How many of us remember that in the lifetime of our grandfather's buffalo outnumbered people in North America? In 1871, you could stand on a bluff anywhere in the Dakotas and see herds that covered grazing areas the size of the state of Rhode Island. And from the height of their population to their final reduction to a zoological curiosity was but seven years, part of the explicit policy of the US cavalry to deny the great plains civilizations of their commissary. And when the last of the buffalo was reduced to a shadow in the prairie and the last 
of the indigenous people were sequestered in reservations. Philip Sheridan, who orchestrated the campaign, suggested to the US Congress that a commemorative medal be minted that would have on the one side of it a dead buffalo and on the other side a dead Indian. Well, some years ago, I made an IMAX film with Bobby Kennedy in the Grand Canyon, a place that is visited by 5 million people every year. 27,000 people float it every summer. Its flow is controlled by technicians at 11 dams. It enters the Gulf of um, Cortez, a river only a name, a shadow in the sand. Well, John Muir visited the Grand Canyon, and he later visited Yosemite. And he did, he was alone. Today, the population of all of Los Angeles visits Yosemite every summer. And yet until 1950, but 100 people had gone down the Grand Canyon, and all of these places were still wild. And how often do we think, wouldn't it be cool if we could just go back to a place that had that kind of resonance, that feeling that Muir sensed? Well, we can. All you have to do is come to Canada. In 1879, John Muir went up the Lower Stikine. He became so enraptured, he went back to California, and he named his dog after that river of enchantment. He counted 300 glaciers along the lower course. He saw flights of eagles in the tens of thousands. He saw goats decorating the cliff sides. He only went as far as the head of navigation at Glenora. He climbed a mountain, looked west, counted another 300 glaciers. But he never went on. He never saw the sacred mountain of the tall town, its Zaidza, its northern flank, covered by this lava valley so wide that to cross it, as the local guides say, takes a pair of boots. It's known as a, it was a sacred mountain. It's the source of all the obsidian that went south as far as Chasta, west to Haida Gwaii, east across the Rocky Mountains. He never saw the spectrum range where it seemed as if God himself was an artist who had on his palette all the colors of the rainbow. He never saw our greatest canyon, which unlike the Grand Canyon of the Colorado, has never permitted a raft to get through it. It's known as the K2 of whitewater challenges. In all of history, less than 100 world-class athletes have managed to get through it. No human being has successfully walked the rim of the canyon. And if Muir had continued beyond the canyon, where the goats cling to the cliffs, inverting their normal behavior, they normally go up to escape predation. In the canyon, they go down into the belly of the earth itself. Had he continued out of the canyon and followed the traditional routes to the interior, he would have come to the most majestic place of all, the sacred headwaters, this extraordinary place that is the birthplace of all the civilizations of the Northwest. I followed the one road north in the 1970s um, to take a job in the Spatsizu Wilderness as the first park ranger. And my job description, I'm sorry this thing is running ahead without me. My job description was deliciously vague, wilderness assessment and public relations. In two long um, seasons, I saw 12 people, so there was no one to relate publicly to. <laughs> Wilderness, wilderness assessment was licensed to ramble. In the course of my ramblings, I came upon an old native grave that just said, love old man Antoine, died 1922. And curious about the origin of this grave, I paddled my canoe across the Headwater Lake to a spike camp where I knew I could meet this man, Alec Jack, whose native name was Atahena, he who walks leaving no tracks. He was a Gitsan man from the Skeena River, whose father was a great friend of the legendary trapper outlaw, Simon Gunanute. And in 1904, the family had moved north into the groundhog country. Alec was actually there at the time when Antoine had died. It turned out that Antoine was a shaman, crippled from birth, who crawled around the Spatsizi on blocks of wood and divined the future by dropping stones into buckets woven from spruce root. And he would look at the patterns in the water. And intrigued by this link between a living elder with whom I could actually converse and a shaman from a pre-contact time, I quit my job as a park ranger and hired on as a hunting guide on the condition that I could always work with Alec. And for two further seasons, I tried to pry from his memory stories of the land. He spoke six languages, and he spoke English with the 
care that one does a second language or a third language, a fourth language. And he would never say, for example, one must not hurt an animal because a hunter must kill an animal upon which he lives. He would always say one must not suffer an animal because suffering implies humiliation and this should never be imposed. But of the original mythological tales, he said he remembered nothing until one day one of our hunters killed a moose and abandoned the carcass and the next day I flew in and chased away a pack of wolves and um, salvaged 2,000 pounds of meat, which I brought down in my wooden canoe two days later. And Alec was on the bank as I arrived at the spike camp, dripped with blood, crusted with blood, and Alec simply looked at the meat and he said, oh, I don't know how you'd do it. You got a lot of respect. And as we took the horses and dragged the meat to the smokehouse to cure it for his winter supply, he suddenly said, Oh, I don't know, I kind of remember a story I come by my place tonight. Well, that night in the flicker of kerosene lamps with rain falling on canvas, I began to record what would be 35 years of recordings of Weeket, the trickster transformer of Git Sound lore, the kind of raven or coyote figure, the, 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 the figure of folly who in his vanity taught the people how to live. And all of these stories were stories of moral rectitude played out upon landscape, and I, at one point I asked Alec how long the cycle of tales was, and he said, well, he'd asked his father that story, and to find out, he said they had put on snowshoes in March month and begun to walk from one end of Black Lake to another, and as he recalled, all the way there, all the way back, story not halfway done, but here was a marvelous metaphor. To measure the duration of a sacred tale, you couldn't set a timepiece. You had to move through sacred geography, telling the story as you went along. Alec told me of the time when the black robes, the Roman Catholic priests, arrived to evangelize his people, isolated in the hinterland, and the, his father, an open-minded fellow, said, well, you know, what's this place like this you call heaven? And the missionary said, well, he's really nice. Everybody's dressed in white a lot of clouds, and everybody gets along. But well, what kind of animal you got up there? No, you don't understand. No, well, if there are no moose, what's a wolf going to eat? Well, there's no moose and no wolves. Well, caribou got to be doing pretty good. No, and suddenly it dawned on Alex's father that heaven was a place where the missionaries didn't allow animals. And, and, and he, he, he just looked at this missionary and said, you've got to be out of your mind. You're telling me I can't swear, I can't mess around on my woman, I can't do all the things that make life worth living to go to a place where you won't allow animals, you can forget about it. <laughs> but that marvelous story gives you a hint of how isolated this place is and was. Remember that until the building of the Panama Canal, the northwest coast of British Columbia was about as far from Europe as you could get. So at a time when Montreal was entering its third century and the Amazon had been thoroughly explored for 400 years, European contact had not arrived in the Pacific Northwest. In the lower 48 of the United States, the furthest you can get away from a maintained road is 20 miles. In the northwest quadrant, where the Stikine rests, an area the size of Switzerland, that quadrant itself is the size of the state of Oregon. There is only one road, this narrow ribbon of asphalt that slips up the side of the coast mountains to Alaska. So the extraordinary thing is that to be with a man like Alec when I was young was to be with a man who was 43 years old before he had sustained, had sustained contact with uh, European society. His soul had never been crushed by the residential schools. And he lived to the age of 96. His wife, Madeline, lived to be 103, the oldest Native woman in British Columbia. She was blind at the time of her end, and she used to read the faces of my little girls every summer like Braille to see how much they had grown up in the winter. And invariably pleased with the results, she would reach into a can of candies and give each of them a candy. And, and Alec used to say, it's a good thing you go down to Vancouver because down south, kids grow bigger. And uh, Alec, before he died, gave me a tool. And it was a specialized instrument given to him in 1904 by his grandfather. I, of course, had no idea what it was, but it turned out to be a, a bone of caribou with a spatula tip serrated, and it was a specialized tool to skin out the eyelids of wolves. And it was only in the wake of his passing, after looking after him for all of those years, that I realized the eyelids in question were my own, and that Alec, having done so much to allow me to see in this remarkable country, had finally uh, found a way to say goodbye. 
Now, isolation has been this country's saving grace, but this very isolation could be its doom. Over all the 40 years that I've lived in this country, we've seen a series of industrial initiatives enter it. The dream of building a, high, a, a railroad, the railroad to nowhere, a scheme to dam the Stikine and the Iskit with seven of the biggest dams in the world. Most of these mega projects have collapsed under the weight of their own stupidity. But in the late 1990s, everything changed with the, in the rise of commodity prices and the um, steroidal growth of the Asian economy. And you have heard of the tar sands of Enbridge, the Keystone pipelines, but all of these are just elements of a kind of tsunami of industrial development that is sweeping over this country. And of course, the liberal government in Victoria has both embraced and fomented this spasm of development. And the focus of the government has largely been on the Northwest and a series of gargantuan projects, all of which fall in Taltan territory. Now, in the meadows of the headwaters itself, we can see these projects here, in the meadows of the headwaters, Royal Dutch Shell had plans to exploit coal bed methane gas over a tenure of a million uh, acres. Fortune Minerals intended to exploit uh, uh, anthracite coal, leveling entire mountains. Um, and on Tottigan Mountain, the uh, wildlife sanctuary in the sky, home to the largest population of stone sheep on the planet, a species that's endemic to this region, Imperial Metals had plans to put in a massive open pit copper and gold mine that over the course of its lifetime would generate 500 million tons of toxic tailings and waste rock. The only challenge for all of these developments was a lack of power. Now back in 2008, the Mining Association of British Columbia published a wildly optimistic survey indicating that $15 billion of capital investment would come to the region were only there to be power. Premier Gordon Campbell, who is a good friend of mine, began the process by um, in, in, infusing this effort with a $10 million um, kickstarting fund. And Campbell, who I really admired, was a wonderful man, but it's significant that in his life and in his two, two terms of office, he would never visit a quarter of the province where his policies were to have such an impact. Now, at the time, there were more cautious voices expressed, including the vice president of the Mining Association of BC, who cautioned that all of these big ticket items might or might not come about. And as he put it, nobody should necessarily go to the bank on this. But of course, somebody did. British Columbians, and in fact, you as Canadian taxpayers, although you probably don't know about it. Within two years, the cost of that extension of the power grid had soared from $400 million to close to $800 million. Of the initial budget of $400 million, $130 million was to come from the Federal Green Infrastructure Fund set aside specifically by our parliament in Ottawa to green our economy. The rationale, the official rationale for the inclusion of those funds in this power line extension was that it was going to get 150 indigenous people in Iskit off diesel generation and lower their carbon footprint, albeit at a per capita cost of 400,000 per head. And it turns out that in building the right-of-way of the Northwest Transmission Line, the equivalent of 14,000 log trucks of wood were simply stacked and burned, releasing an estimated 400,000 tons of CO2, which was the equivalent of 150 years of Iskit's uh, production of diesel generation. Well, it was no question that this power line was designed to facilitate the needs of industry, and there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with government investing in infrastructure to promote economic growth. But things get a little murkier when the benefits of such an investment accrue exclusively to one sector of the economy, and they get downright murky when they accrue to one company and indeed one individual. And here was the other challenge for the government. The Red Chris play on imperial, uh, 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 of imperial metals on Tottigan Mountain was only kept afloat by the personal investment of Murray Edwards, one of our wealthier citizens. I know Murray well. We were on the board of the Banff Center together. He's a wonderful man. He's done great things for Canada. But he effectively had become the single largest stockholder in this enterprise um, on 
Cardigan Mountain. Now, the challenge there was that in the 2013 provincial elections, he had hosted a fundraiser for Christy Clark that raised $1 million that had allowed the Liberal Party to do a media buy that turned the corner on that campaign. Again, nothing illegal in this, but hardly something to reassure British Columbian people, given that for the Red Crest, for a moment, had become the only viable industrial project. And here was the heart of the problem. What had begun as a dream of development with six to seven to eight major projects had come down to one. Because Galore Creek had imploded due to mismanagement and poor cost estimates, in 2012, Royal Dutch Shell, to its immense credit, retre re retreated from the um, headwaters. Fortune um, will never be able to develop the anthracite play given the opposition of the Iskit people. And so in the end, the challenge for the government became that they had run the risk of spending nearly a billion dollars of taxpayers' money to build a power line possibly to nowhere. Because the end point of the power line was simply a hydro, a highway yard that had but a handful of people. And recall that in the early 1970s, when the government built a railroad to nowhere at the cost of a billion dollars, its collapse and bankruptcy brought down the government. And the optics became even more complicated because the one developed in place, in, in, in place Phil, Imperial's mine on Tottigan, was on the most extraordinary wildlife center in British Columbia. It's a wildlife sanctuary in the sky, home to the largest population of stone sheep, as I said, on the planet. It's the only place in Canada where you can take your child by the hand, walk up in an hour and be surrounded by 500 sheep being hunted by wolves and black bear and grizzly. It's the most dense concentration of wildlife in British Columbia. And there are over 4,000 copper and gold projects in the world. And to plant one on top of Tottigan Mountain, looking west as it does to the sacred mountain at Zaidza, looking north to Canada's greatest canyon, looking east into Spatsizi, the Serengeti of Canada, to place an open pit copper and gold mine on Tottigan, which is also surrounded, as it is, by nine incomparable lakes of the Iskit headwaters, including Yalui Lake, where I have my home, La Yalui flows into Tottigan. And so this is one of the most beautiful places in all of British Columbia. And to put an open pit copper and gold mine there is rather like drilling for oil in the Sistine Chapel. Now, the actual initiative at Red Chris, which has in fact been approved, is in production, called for the burial of this entire valley with toxic tailings, begging the question as to what you would need to do to fail an environmental assessment process in British Columbia. But here's the dilemma for the government. They only have one possible project. So they don't simply become an advocate for industry or sympathetic with industry, which is completely legitimate for a government to do. They not only d dilute their environmental assessment process, this is a government that for political reasons simply must have this mine, or they will be seen to have spent over $800 million building a power line to nowhere. And so if the optics were already bad with this massive initiative in this, in this beautiful area, remember that the Italians pond will drain directly into these two lakes, Tottigan and Klahuya, go down the valley into Edontenejon, Totoga, and eventually into Kiniskan, go over the incomparable Cascade Falls, and eventually reach its confluence with the Stikin, one of the great Samoth-bearing rivers at home. Now, if the optics of the, this play were complicated for the government, they became downright impossible with the Mount Pauly disaster in the summer of 1914, the catastrophic failing of the Tailings Dam at Imperial Metals' other site um, in British Columbia. Now, in the wake of that disaster, the government moved slowly. Um, it took Imperial 24 hours even to make a public statement. The president of the company assured everybody that he'd be happy to drink the sediments as long as, as soon as the mud had settled. Uh, it was described by the company and by the government as a minor breach of the dam when anyone on YouTube could see that it was in fact a catastrophic failure. 
that resulted, in fact, in the discharge of 17 million cubic meters of industrial water, 8 million cubic meters of solid materials tainted with heavy metals. It was the equivalent of filling some 10,000 Olympic swimming pools with toxic water, enough solid waste to cover all of Vancouver's Stanley Park with close to two meters of toxic sludge. Christy Clark, of course, made the gesture of doing a prayer circle with the local people, though it was her policies that set this in motion. What possessed the then Minister of the Energy and Mines, Bill Bennett, to compare this breakage to the many thousands of snow avalanches that occur in the province every year is an open question. Overnight, Imperial stock plummeted, and it was only the ongoing investment of Mr. Edwards that allowed the company to stay afloat. Now, this disaster naturally sent shockwaves to the Iskut community, and the elders were, were shocked because they had been promised that the Red Crest tailings impoundment would be designed to the exactly the same design protocols that had featured so successfully at Mount Polly. And then they saw what, in fact, had happened there. And they heard the media reports that employees at Mount Pauly had quit their high-paying jobs when management had refused to listen to their concerns about the safety and integrity of the dam. They learned that independent consultants hired by Imperial had expressed similar concerns. They learned, too, that the insurance policies held by the company were a mere $15 million when comparable cleanups in Spain and Tennessee had cost as much as $600 million. And they were shocked to learn that the facility being proposed for their homeland was exactly what had failed at Mount Pauly. And there was the strongest sense in Iskut and throughout British Columbia that this disaster at Mount Pauly would at least cause the government to slow down at Red Chris until it was understood what in fact had happened at Mount Pauly. When the independent reports were finally released, the Vice President for Corporate Affairs of Imperial, another nice man, Steve Robertson, said that there's a great opportunity for us to move forward because the panel has concluded that there was but one single cause for the failure, a design flaw, but that was simply untrue. The panel had, in fact, recognized that there were any number of ways in which this dam could have breached, and they concluded that multiple failure modes were in progress, and they differed mainly in how far they had progressed down their respective failure pathways. Mount Polly, in fact, was not a story of one flaw that went undetected. Um, rather, it was characterized by a pattern of dubious behaviors, clear breaches of margins of safety that skirted the edge of the cliff, little thought to worst case scenarios, and, and hardly words that were going to re reassure the, the tall tan people. And to this date, Imperial has been largely deaf to public concerns. They have built, for example, sample their own power line up the side of the Stuart Cassiar, compromising the most beautiful road in British Columbia, aside from the Jasper Banff corridor. And they were expected to leave a leaf strip that would have at least insulated the tourist traffic from the industrial um, power line. This simply was not done, and Imperial simply cited contractor error. Secondly, Imperial needs to come clean with what their actual plans are for this mine. They were, in fact, licensed for a production of 30,000 tons of rock a day for 30 years, but they are already on record as saying that they want to increase that production fivefold to 150,000 tons, and that, of course, would imply the excavation of literally cubic miles of rock. Now, given this history, you would have thought that there would have been some cause for the government to act, if only to slow down the development of Red Chris until proper controls had been put in place. But in fact, the opposite happened. Using the Kafkas logic that Imperial Metals needed the revenue flow from Red Chris to fund the cleanup at Mount Pauly, the Red Chris project was in fact fast-tracked and allowed to go online within six months of the disaster at Mount Pauly. Within less than a year, the government authorized Mount Pauly to return to normal operations, processing 20,000 tons of rock to this uh, a day. And to this day, Imperial Metals has not paid one penny of fines for its negligence. And the government, in fact, has 
in, for a Red Chris mine allowed a bond for the closure of the mine of a mere $12 million when all estimates are that the cleanup of Red Chris eventually will cost up to $50 million. So the Red Chris mine is fully in, in production. It'll generate uh, enormous revenues, allowing Imperial to recoup its investment by their own estimates in four to seven years. Over the 28-year lifespan of the mine, they will produce three billion pounds of copper, over five million ounces of gold at a value of some $20 billion. 250 men and women will have jobs. Murray Edwards, already worth 2.2 billion, will be worth a lot more, as will be a handful of principals at Imperial. And given this windfall, you would have thought there'd be no excuse but to build an exemplary mine at Tottigan, but that's not occurring and only time will tell what the consequences will be. So all of these sort of discouraging statistics aside, what, what do these minds tell us about ourselves? I remember a friend of mine died on his trap line and I was in his lodge and he sort of was, was seen right out of Jack London. There were 90 feet of snow had fallen in the valley. And I looked in his lodge thinking of Mike and I saw this woman who was clearly an engineer from Red Chris and this official I had never met who was a bureaucrat from Victoria. And they began to have a conversation that went like this. They just both come down from the mine site. Wow, did you see all those sheep? Never seen so many sheep in my life. Did you see the wolves? I've never seen wolves like that. I've never seen wild like that in my life. The most beautiful place I've ever been. So here they were. They couldn't talk breathlessly extolling the place that it was their bureaucratic and corporate mission to destroy. And I kept thinking, can't they get that disconnect? And I think that's the thing we have to recognize. It's not an issue of mines or no mines. It's how many mines, in what places, at what cost to the environment, and critically, for whose benefit. And if we can't trust the government and Imperial today to act in the interests of, of the public good, how much can we trust them to act in 40 years' time? And this is a question that is being asked by the elders. And for more than a decade, the Taltan clans, both Wolf and Crow, have actively opposed many of these assaults on their land. Men, women, and children have stood up in all weather on blockades. This is a photograph that I showed to um, Premier Campbell when I first met with them. This photograph appeared in the National Geographic magazine. I must say women from all around the world made a beeline for Iskut, British Columbia. Uh, <laughs> Oscar once called me up, he's my best friend, Oscar, he called me up and said, Wade, there's this woman from Moscow coming to see me. And I said, that's the most ridiculous thing, you just had someone from Warsaw there last week. I know. Well, you don't speak Polish or Russian. I know, they don't really come for conversation. <laughs> but the point, the point is that this is a photograph, and the five years before this photograph was taken, and I have permission of the family to share with this, Oscar's brother hung himself in his basement, another brother drowned five feet from shore, another brother died of medical malpractice, a sister died on the streets of Prince George, and, a, and his only daughter blew her head off playing Russian roulette in a handgun, which turned out to be a drug hit. In those five years, Bear Gold took out of Taltan territory and land that belongs to the Taltan, 400 tons of gold, 5,000 tons of silver, at a market value of $20 billion, and I asked the Premier, why isn't there a hockey rink in Iskut? Why hasn't their infrastructure changed one bit in 40 years? Why aren't there low interest loans so their kids can go to college like my kids go to college? Why aren't, there's a, you know, why aren't there loans for individuals to start small businesses? And of course, the Premier had no answer to that. And Oscar's father did have an answer for that. Jimmy always says it's really simple. Let's get all the kids up. The kids of those big shots and our kids, we send them out in the land, we get the kids to cut a deal. For every tree that comes down in our territory, a rose bush comes down on their homes in Rosedale and Caresdale. For every river of ours that gets polluted, poison goes into their swimming pool at the local YMCA. And maybe they'll finally come to understand. And Oscar's mother, Mary, um, always says that the measure of a tall tan these days is not blood, but the way you relate to the land. And back in the 70s, when I first lived in the, in the country, uh, during the height of the fears of the, the, um, the dam projects of, of BC Hydro, there was a gathering in Iskit where a young hippie back to the lander stood up and in what he thought was a gesture of solidarity said to the assembly, you know, if they build these dams, I'm just gonna have to leave this country. And in an immense gesture of dignity, a young Taltan Luth 
stood up right afterwards and turned to that speaker and he said, you know, partner, that's the difference between me and you. If they build these dams, I'm still gonna be here. And for nearly 40 years now, the Stikin has called me home, has called me home. and the time I knew that I would always um, be there was when I recalled the words of my mentor, the poet Gary Snyder said, the best thing we could possibly do for the environment is to stay put. And the time I knew this was the night that my daughter Raina went out on the lake after dark. And she's always loved this place. Alec Jack used to always say, you know, there's some, in Athabascan culture, you will pass around children. If you have too many and someone else doesn't have enough, they'll be raised by the community. And there's always one, he says, that she's gonna stay by you. And he always said of this little rain that she was gonna stay by him. When she was five years old, she disappeared, and I found her an hour and a half later, way up in the woods, trying to stroke a dead black bear cub back to life. And Alec took that as a sign of her commitment to this country. And this night, when she was 21, she was paddled across the lake, this very cold lake. When I went to find out what had happened to her, I found her on a favorite spot, this promontory overlooking the lake, and she said, she was crying and sobbing, and I, and I asked the obvious question as a father, and she said, Daddy, this is my home. This is a vortex of my life. It's so very beautiful. It's where I want to live, and it's where I want to die. And in that moment, even as the engineers and drillers at Red Chris went about their work not five kilometers from where we sat, I promised my daughter that we would never leave that lake, and that even if the mine did go ahead and has gone ahead, we would wait it out as a family, along with the families of our Taltan brothers and sisters in Iskit. And I told her that I might not be around in 40 years to hear the return of silence to the lake, but she would be, and her daughter would be. And that's what the Taltan have been telling me for 40 years. That's what they mean. But you know, the plight of the sacred headwaters isn't just a local issue. It's really about our destiny as Canadians. It's really about how do we want to live as a nation. These kind of projects will only continue to go ahead if we accept that people who have never been on the land, who have no history or connection to the country, may legally come in and by the very nature of their enterprises leave in their wake a cultural and physical landscape transformed and desecrated. They'll go ahead only if we continue to endorse a process that grants mining concessions, often for trivial sums, to speculators from distant cities even as we place no cultural value on the land or monetary value on the land left alone. They'll go ahead if we maintain that the cost of developing a natural asset or its inherent worth if left intact need not have a metric in the economic calculations that support the industrialization of the wild. They will go ahead if we remain committed to the notion that no private company has to compensate the public for what it does to the commons the forests, the lakes, the rivers, which by definition belong to all of us. They will go ahead as long as we continue to embrace a mindset that has no place in a world in which wild lands are becoming increasingly rare and valuable, even as we strive as a species to live in a sustainable manner on a planet that we have come to recognize as being resilient but not inviolable. And in the end, what is at stake is the future of one of the most extraordinary regions in all of North America, and indeed, in all of the world. And so the fate of the sacred headwaters transcends the interests of local residents, provincial agencies, politicians, mining companies, and even those few amongst the First Nations blindly in favor of development at any cost. And so it's one of those issues that, where the voices of all Canadians need to be heard. And despite Christy Clark's claim that we have the highest standards of sustainable mining in the world, um, whatever that means, uh, this is not a story of sustainability. It's a story of corruption and greed and of a government serving the interest of a single industry, indeed a single company, and not the patrimony of the nation. It's a story of politicians concerned more about the next election than the next generation. And this really represents a struggle, not just for the North, but for the entire hinterland of our country. It's political. It's not about sustainability. It's not about recycling garbage. It's about returning democracy, honor, truth, and transparency to the public discourse and dialogue. It's not about reducing consumption, but rather of increasing political and environmental vigilance. 
It's not about reusing paper, plastic, and tin. It's about regenerating the promise and the hope and the dream of real democracy. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Wade, for a remarkable and uh, utterly compelling story, and a really important one. Nous avons maintenant une période pour les questions. We have time for questions. We've got roughly 12 minutes, so please, there are two microphones. Uh, anyone who would like to uh, pose a question, vous pouvez uh, poser des questions ou en français ou en anglais. Uh, please be as brief as possible so that we can have a few questions. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, what begs the question is, now with the election in BC, because there's a big fight that's been going on for years against Site C on the Peace River, the hydroelectric project, where they think they've already spent a couple, two billion or something on it. And a lot of people, amongst them, the native people have, have opposed it and say, we don't need more. Where, where do you think that's gonna go? You know, I think one of the things, Site C is, a, you know, the follow-up to Williston, uh, to the Bennett Dam. You know, Ross Beatty, who is um, one of the main, main figures in the mining industry, he's also one of the greatest environmentalists. Uh, he's also at the cutting edge of, of um, the new energy economy. He is absolutely convinced that Site C is a boondoggle, totally unnecessary for the electric needs of our province. It represents one of those infrastructure projects Bobby Kennedy just had a great interview where he talks about these pipelines, the desperate thing to get these pipelines, it's kind of the last gasp of the old economy. You know, a a Amory Levins has a wonderful thing where he shows two photographs, New York City in 1903 and New York City, the same street in 1913. In 1903, there's one automobile and thousands of, of horses. In 1913, there's one horse and thousands of automobiles. We're about to shift our entire energy economy. And that's why I oppose all of these pipeline infrastructure projects, because they actually just perpetuate the, the, the dying embers of that old carbon-based economy. At some point, we, we need to transition, but at some point, we've got to make the break. And I think Site C, the government's rush to get so much money spent that you feel like you've got to complete it simply because we spent so much money. And I, 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 I fear that that will lead to its completion. Thank you. Uh, that was amazing. I feel very privileged to have been uh, part of the audience. Um, my question is somewhat related to the last question and also in BC about politics, because there's obviously one party nationally and provincially that is you know, very associated with green projects and opposing these kinds of things, but they're very marginal, although they may play a role in uh, BC politics. And I was just wondering if you had any comments in your travels across the country, talking to people about this and how they make political choices, why this isn't more of a political issue, if you will, that's represented in the way people vote. One of the things, you know, Canadians love the idea of the North, but none of us go there. Um, you know, and Americans look west for heroes, we look north for heroes, but we don't go there enough. So, you know, I, for example, I do a lot of guiding still in the Stikeen, and we, we do these horseback non-consumptive trips, and they're almost all British Columbians and wealthy pr British Columbians who've been everywhere in the world, but Northern British Columbia. As I said, Gordon Campbell, hugely cosmopolitan guy, had never been to a quarter of British Columbia. So that, you know, that's one of the challenges we, we have. Um, and um, remember, the Liberal Party in BC has got nothing to do with the Federal Liber Liberal Party, and it was an amalgamation of conservative parties in BC. The Greens under Andrew have, have tremendous leverage, but one of the things we've always been cursed in British Columbia is that, you know, since I was a child, our politicians from all sides have been saying that the only way we can generate an economy in our massive land mass, the size of California, Oregon, Washington put together, low population, highly educated, the best university systems in the world, the most entrepreneurial Canadians you can find, uh, the most fun-loving Canadians you could find, and they actually do work sometimes in Vancouver, but 
Uh, what I mean is, you know, they've been telling us all my life, the only way we can generate economy is by cutting down timber, my, digging up our earth, and basically maintaining a kind of 19th century economy. And this is not a lack of economic opportunity. It's a dearth of imagination on the parts of those we elect. And, and this has been our curse. And part of it also is, you know, all politics is local. So you have in a legislature, and again, it's because in Canada, of course, provinces control these resource decisions, which is very different than the states, for example. And so we have, we have um, people who have run used car lots and bless them for that and, and have become elected, become MLAs in Victoria and before you know it, they're the Minister of Energy and Mines or a real estate agent and we're putting up side by side with sharks from Asia who have, who have been responsible for the pillaging of half of Southeast Asia and who's gonna come ahead? I mean, we, we, we don't have the caliber of talent standing up for us in the government, in the, in the legislature. We have some fantastic individual people and Andrew Weaver is a great guy. But I think that's been one of our historic problems. You know, we, we tend to be too provincial. And I don't mean to say that in an elitist way, I think it's just the case. I mean, our premier, bless her, I think it was twice or three times he tried to get through college, right? I mean, I mean, and that doesn't mean she's a bad person, but does she have the wisdom, the worldliness to understand what we have in British Columbia? And you know, I, I travel all around the world. Uh, I've, I go to 50 countries a year for the National Geographic, and the world is getting worn out. It's sad, but true. And BC is not worn out, and it is such a precious jewel. And we, we should be recognizing that with every public policy decision we make. If I can say, as a former president of the University of British Columbia, I endorse everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> It was unbelievably frustrating to try and get the government to think outside of the resource box. Yeah. Unbelievable. And yet, and yet, you know, Stephen, I mean, if you look at the statistics, I mean, uh, tourism employs more people now than logging, mining, and commercial fishing put together. IT is the dominant economy of Vancouver. Vancouver is now home to, I'm on the board of the TED, the TED Brain Trust, they call it, the board of the TED Conference. It's not an accident we're in Vancouver, and we're gonna stay in Vancouver. Vancouver is the most happening city, I think, on the planet. So it's not that we don't have intellectual and social capital there. It's just that we need to get more of that into office. Yes. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. And Davis. I, I think we'll have time for the two who are here, and that'll be it, I'm afraid. Go ahead. All right, well, thank you. Uh, sorry, my name is uh, Jamie Snook, and I uh, live in the north, and I'm the mayor of Happy Valley Goose Bay. Uh, I happen to be uh, in Inuk, and our community is located on the traditional homelands of the Innu Nation and the Inuit. And for the four, last four years, I guess, I've been fighting almost on a daily basis uh, uh, looking for changes in relation to the Muskrat Falls project in Labrador. And I guess what I was hoping uh, to get some thoughts on from you is, uh, in your advocacy efforts, uh, is there anything in particular that you've seen work and, and actually help make change? Because it's really tiring to say Well, I know. Bit. You know, we, we worked 12 years, uh, you know, on this campaign. and. But you know, the great thing about it is there wasn't one NGO involved in this campaign. There was a tall tan elders, um, it was, you know, and it was local people. In terms of the non-native people in our campaign, we could all fit into an SUV. But that's what made it strong in a way. And I'll, I'll tell you two quick anecdotes. First of all, in all of these conflicts, they're never enemies, they're only solutions. And it's, it, it's insane to whitewash any sector of the economy with the same brush. And so for example, um, Shell, we knew Shell had some vulnerabilities. Why? Because they're a huge company. Uh, they had a bad exposure in, in Nigeria. They had tried to make up for that in their practices in, in oil and gas in Peru. And I had the good fortune, the good luck, that at the TED conference in 2010, um, um, uh, the head of Shell for all of the Americas was attending his first TED conference. And I got Chris Anderson to give me three minutes that I squeezed to eight minutes. As you can tell, I'm good at doing. And, uh, and then I just got to stage, showed those images, and then killed Shell with kindness. I, and, and I said at the end, you know, we don't want just our 
friends are the good people at Shell to leave the valley. We want them to join us and come together and move forward as we do the impossible, create the biggest protected area of Canada. And Marvin, um, he, he, right after that there was a luncheon and I went up to him and his wife and all the conversation at the luncheon about Energy Futures was about the sacred headwaters and I gave the book, you never give the book to the guy, you always give it to the spouse. Um, and I just said, I'd love to help you any way I could. And he just said three things to me. We, I didn't know it was that beautiful. I didn't know it was that important for First Nations. And we don't go where we're not wanted. Well, that might not have been true. But, uh, <laughs> but I knew that we had won. And eight months later, they announced their withdrawal. So, you know, I think you reach out to people on a human level and, and, and it makes a big difference. And remember that change is tough, but it happens. And it, I mean, look at Haida Gwaii. I used to be a logger in Haida Gwaii when the multinational companies dominated both the society, the economy of the place. I just went up last month to Gujao's potlatch when he became a hereditary chief of the Skidans clan. Now, I mean, the, the first poll was put up by Jim Reed and Gujao in 1976, Robert Davidson. Now the islands have sprouted poles. You know, that, that line on the map that is Guayanas, the National Park of Guayanas, that started because Tom Henley and Gujao couldn't sleep one night. They went down to Jim Fulton's cabin on the Tulel River, got out of a road map of British Columbia, and drew a line across it and said, we're going to stop any logging south of here. That line is a line of the National Park. So, and that was because the elders stood up. So the power of the First Nations is so moving, right? So every, everything can be won as long as we don't make the other side enemies. Yes, uh, we have five minutes, so okay. I'm gonna have to ask everyone to be succinct. Thank you. Okay. I was very moved by, by your talk. I, I'm Peruvian, and I was thinking about how in, in Peru, all there are all, we have all these mining companies, and most of the money for the government comes from the mining, and there's a lot of social problems, and a lot of projects get blocked because of the community, and there's also, and it's true, all this destruction going on of the natural areas and the cultures. At the same time, the justification is that we also have 30% of our population in poverty, and you know, a homeless person in Canada has more access to healthcare and food than a poor person in Peru. So uh, I was thinking, how is it, is that, I, I don't really know if, what's your opinion? Is this the way to economic development? I mean, I, I, I don't I, what I don't understand is why such a rich country as Canada goes to, to do projects like that if you don't even have like the justification of poverty. <laughs> Well, th there's one word, greed. I mean, I mean, it just comes down to greed. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I think of all of these characters who, who live in Vancouver and, and, and get out on their, their boats in their Gulf Islands and radio, uh, phone back to Toronto, their colleagues here in the banks, and boast of living in beautiful British Columbia where they can golf by day and ski by night, even as their initiatives are compromising the very hinterland they praise. But, you know, again, Peru, I, I served as an advisor to, the, to uh, Hunt Oil's uh, PNG, uh, oil and gas pipeline down there, and Mr. Hunt came up to me once in, uh, after a lecture and he said, I, I'd spoken about shamanism and voodoo and, and hallucinogens, and he said, his first words to me were, you know, well, I didn't understand everything he had to say last night, but I got a little bitty project in Peru, and my name's in this company, my son's name's in this company, we won't do it right, and I'd like you to do, help me do it right. Well, I signed on with Tom Lovejoy, who invent, invented the term biodiversity, and Mr. Hunt did it right. He spent one time, there was one phone call from Bruce Babbitt saying the pipeline shouldn't go here. We called Dallas, got right through to Mr. Hunt, and he just said, pipeline shouldn't be there, fellas. Where should it be? Well, sir, we think it should be over here. Okay, fellas, that you say so. Click $30 million, they move the pipeline. That was an exemplary project, which has given hundreds of millions of dollars to Peru. The challenge in Peru is once the money's in the treasury, how it's spent. Look at the Chinchero Airport. They just got ca ca canceled, right? So again, it's not like you can't blacken a sector of the economy. We need to transition off carbon. There's going to be some oil and gas exploration as we transition off. But we all have to be moving forward. And, and again, it gets back to the same question. It's not n mines or no mines. It's how many mines for whose benefit at what cost to the environment. Thank you very much. Last question. Quick. Like you, I'm an anthropologist. Um, I am from here originally. I now live in the, uh, the province that is probably the most vilified in Canada. I live in Alberta, where we have the best possible 
provincial government, um, but that's at risk. Um, so I work in the same place that Imre Zeman works, and we are very concerned about things like energy transition. What I'm asking for is maybe some help with vocabulary, and the vocabulary in answer to a particular kind of question which you hear very, very frequently in Alberta. And the question is, hey, Wade, you fly all over the place. Where do you get your fuel from for your plane? How the hell do you think you're going to get there? Well, that, yeah. How do you justify the hypocrisy? Yeah, but that's My like... research is in the Pacific. I've worked with Panguna Mine, the biggest copper mine in the world. I don't have an answer when people say, how can you go to your field site? Well, you know, it's sort of like, it's like the same, you know, we, 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 the Pope drives the Pope mobile, but he wouldn't drill for oil in the Sistine Chapel. It's as simple as that, you know. I mean, of course we can have some developments and, and, and certainly airplane flight is something we're going to need f liquid fuels for for some time. But that's sort of a, a, a kind of a, you know, you know, I, 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 I think the main, the main way that we, 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 you argue and win is with the facts, the truth. You know, eventually the truth runs out. And again, this thing of not making enemies. I'll just give one final kind of uplifting way to end this. Years ago, in the 80s, as the battles in the forest were beginning in British Columbia, I was kind of hijacked or, or ambushed on a live talk TV show with Jack Monroe, who was head of the IWA, International Woodworkers Association. He didn't know I was going to be on. I didn't know he was going to be on. I didn't care, but he was very nervous. He was a great big bull of a man, a wonderful guy. And he was terrified. Like He, he was pissed. He was angry. You know. And just before we went to air, I just leaned over to him and I said, you know, Mr. Monroe, I just have to take a moment to thank you because your union put me through university. <laughs> and he couldn't believe it. And he said, what are, you, what are you talking about? What local? I named the local. Where was it? Dean and Bay. What did you do? I threw beads. And then we sort of talked. And then I went and proceeded in that interview to say exactly what I was going to say as a legitimate critique of the industrial forestry, which I knew very well, having been an engineer for Macmillan Blodell. And by the end of that interview, I hadn't changed my rhetoric one bit or the content of what I was going to say. I hadn't pandered in the slightest, but Mr. Monroe, bless him, he's passed away long ago, he put his big arm around me on live TV and said, you know, I can't talk as good as this kid. I never got to go to college, but this is the kind of fine young man that my union makes for the province. <laughs> and that's, you know, being an anthropologist, you know, I mean, part of it is, as anthropologists, you, you know, you, your, your whole vibe is you know how to go to the heart and the soul of a person without judgment, and that's the key. Join me in thanking Wade Davis. <laughs>